So hi, I'm Betsy Morris, Reigns Cohen. We are co-hosts, organizers, consultants, and coaches with Co-Housing California, which advances and promotes all manner of intentional self-governing community development. So uh, later today, we'll have Steve Barton, who is a uh, housing former housing director and housing economist who, and planner who will speak to the bigger issues here in the Bay Area around the housing crisis and things we might change. But let's just say it, it here in the Bay Area, we, it is crisis mode. We have a 30-year shortage of all of housing at almost every scale uh, above, you know, below the uh, top 10 or 20 percent of the market. Um, and today our area, Bay Area government acknowledges that uh, 43% of all the nine county households are overpaying, which means that they are sacrificing other parts of their budget to take care of housing. And 23% are seriously overpaying. Uh, another just dire statistic in my mind is that we are rapidly becoming an economy here in the Bay Area of low income jobs. That will surprise people, but it's important to bring that in mind. Uh, at the same time, we already have a, a large multi-thousands of units shortage in affordable housing, but the former forms of subsidies that used to support that are, have been evaporating. Uh, not a single county in the U.S. provides enough housing for its low-income people, and that affects everybody else up the scale of incomes in, to, to a certain extent, and I hope to hear more about, about that from our macro economists. Um, so let me just say that right now, building uh, the existing public funding, uh, because market is, the market is delivering higher and higher priced land, which is higher and higher priced housing, whether you're building it new or renting, and uh, it's costing between $200,000 and $600,000 in upfront subsidy, uh, many of it, much of it tax credit um, uh, programs uh, that mostly benefit accredited investors. Uh, $600,000 per unit to bring it, make it affordable to someone making 80% of the area needed income or below, it's pretty huge. So what's going on? I think other people here will speak to it, but you know we have a debt-fueled housing development process and we've lost sight of other alternatives besides ever more privatizing and um, public assets and privatizing the housing market. It's like we've forgotten that other alternatives exist, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, but the whole surge in nonprofit affordable subsidized housing or for-profit subsidized housing is that residents and their communities uh, benefit passively, but uh, no equity or wealth is built. No self-determining ability to say, how am I gonna, how am I gonna use this? Uh, build something that I can use for other productive purposes. Because you can't use your subsidized housing for anything but living it. Okay, so tiny home villages, tiny houses, super cute, the kittens of the housing world. Here's this beautiful, it's, it's a mock-up, it doesn't exist. Uh, but it's not legal yet. Jay Schaefer up in Sonoma County has been talking about this for two years with city planner, with county planners. No go yet. We'll talk a little more about why that is. But Fresno this winter passed an ordinance that defines a tiny house as a, uh, uh, an RV. So it takes standard codes and regulations for RVs and says as long as you hide that, the wheels, uh, you can actually park it as a backyard cottage. So sweet has to be under, under the legal, current legal minimum, but it has to be at least 100 square feet. So there are some tiny homes that have surfaced in the news, and here's what we know. <laughs> we know that there's a tiny house hotel in Portland that charges upwards of $200 a night. Uh, I've seen ads in Craigslist. Let me pitch my tent in your backyard for $1,000 a month. Uh, I met a man who runs an RV park up in the Delta, and he said, oh, tiny homes can come and park with me. Uh, I said, how much? He said, oh, $1,000. That's not for the home, that's for the hookup, that's for the land. Uh, once again, here in Berkeley, you could see Airbnb alternatives, another Craigslist you add, rent our tiny house, you find the land, we'll charge you just $700 a month. 
or buy this tiny house, and the upper limit really uh, should be about 80,000. That's for a Jay Schaefer custom special. So am I at 10 minutes? Was that that ding? Okay. So just to understand these, the idea about certain types of tiny homes are circulating heavily with local cities and citizens, um, but we're not making a lot of headway yet, except Oakland just, just made some advances. Okay, so now I tie this back to intentional community and what our previous speaker spoke about, the commons, the idea of land as commons. These are national and international networks of uh, people who have chosen to live in communities or buildings or properties where they share ownership of the land or of the actual housing in one way or another. Some are nonprofits, so you don't have a direct equity stake. Um, most of them are limited equity, so these are not for profit, but you still could grow wealth. And I just invite you to understand that there's uh, well over a million people, multiples of millions of people living around the world or striving to live in uh, cooperative um, land commons type housing communities. All right, so like where? Uh, this is a, uh, a lovely image of a self-built house. Uh, you know, you can feel the empowerment and pride of this young couple. Uh, and they live at Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, which is a community started about 1992, has grown to 70 members, hopes to grow to 500. As a village, it's a community-owned land trust governed by the a portion of the by by all the members who contribute to it. Uh, they have a car co-op, they have a local currency, but most importantly, you can build your own home, you can even rent it to a limited degree. As long as the homes are in active use, you have a lease. But should you move, that lease gets reassigned and you can sell or rent your structure, which you've built. That's in Missouri, yeah. So Los Angeles Eco Village also established in the early 1990s, uh, urban uh, setting. In this case, they were able, after the Rodney King riots, uh, a, a nonprofit purchased uh, uh, two apartment buildings, and it is now a cooperative housing community governed by its own members, uh, and sitting on a land trust, community land trust, uh, also governed by a, another subset of members, but it has some independent members as well. So, so this is a, a community that belongs to something called Rock USA, resident-owned communities, and it is Rock USA helps uh, residents of home parks, mobile home parks, and manufactured homes to create cooperatively owned, so that they will, in perpetuity, have be able to determine what's affordable, as well as having responsibility for keeping it up. So, who else is succeeding here on the West Coast? Well, it turns out that really, if we're really talking tiny homes uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an urban area where there are jobs and, uh, and um, where in fact these tiny homes are illegal, unlike Scott County, Missouri, uh, one of the big inspirations was Dignity Village, which was a, a politically inspired homeless protest encampment that over the course of a year in Portland uh, built, grew, grew enough support that the city gave it some land nine miles out from downtown. It's, it's a, this is the unfortunate aspect of it, but they have strived to be a self-governing community, but in return for getting public permits, um, uh, they've maintained the, the governance, but it's essentially a, a two-year transitional homeless community, self-governing, and it has inspired numerous other places. Up in the right, numerous other experiments and ongoing projects now. Uh, up in the right are the basic core community agreements that are underlying the self-governing, usually partnerships, uh, of each of these communities. So you're not a consumer, you're not a client, you're, you're, not a re you're a resident, but you, you are a community member with rights and responsibilities. And you learn how to, how, you might learn that along the way. Here's some other experiments of using tiny homes to create transitional housing communities. Um, this own village, Occupy Madison, is another example of a self-governing village, um, or at least collaboratively self-governed. Uh, some of the others are collaboratively governed with a, a faith-based nonprofit, but this one is Occupy Madison. Uh, this is the most, probably to me, the most important and distinctive, and that is, uh, 
Opportunity Village in Eugene, which has been up, up and operating just two years. Uh, but it's 30 homes. You can see it at the very beginning. And Rain's, if you, I have copies of this Tent City Urbanism book, which I recommend highly. And the reason is, we have a divide. Oh, homeless housing, that's for some kind of special people. But as a self-governing community, the design of these, uh, the design is based on village and co-housing designs, designs that, that are kind of tried and true. Uh, and we'll see how, how this goes, but the city has renewed the lease uh, for the second time, and the city of Eugene has approved, or is in the process of approving uh, Emerald Village, which will be a rent-to-own community permanently affordable housing with a, with a larger mix of incomes and people who are ready uh, to and want to sort of own their own unit and stick around. The, the city waived permits for this, which is what made it economically feasible. So where am I on time? Uh, I, oh, I'm on zero. Where am I? Can someone start me over here? Let's start it again, okay. I'll try to go to five. All right, so here's the thing. The great thing about uh, Georgia's land economics is it provides a, a theoretical, logical theoretical basis for looking at situations and saying, how could this work? Uh, the kinds of communities I'm showing you are living examples of efforts not to talk about some overarching big macro global economy, but rather on the ground, what does it look like to share the earth? in small scale. And uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, is an was a political scientist who walked into the lion's den of economists and uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2008 for years, decades of research showing, in effect, that there is a body of self-governing uh, um, entities around the world that have sustainably managed watersheds, forests, fisheries, uh, wilderness areas. Uh, and, and she distilled, and she and her colleagues distilled eight key principles that were found in all of the commons, collaboratively governed, com well let me put it this way, all the commons that were sustained over the period of research uh, and long term had these characteristics of local, local decision making by local stakeholders, accountable to each other, but recognized by larger government systems, networking where that was feasible, and um, where when people, and had clear boundaries about both members, about you know, users and members, and the physical resource. So, I've been inspired by this to compare it to multiple other design principles to compare her findings based on many years of research uh, with other design principles invoked by these historic movements that I mentioned before, in particular housing cooperatives, which may or may not follow these, but they still say they are in alignment. Uh, and also these cooperative principles uh, Mondragon, which is uh, the world's largest federation of worker-owned businesses, uh, uses these principles plus adds a few more of their own. Uh, the national, the North American Students of Cooperation use these principles. This is in the, what is that, the right-hand side. So we're starting to see a body of knowledge that allows uh, and allows conversation with the policy makers who primarily rely on traditional market, traditional economic theories, whether it's of the state intervention or of free market rampant, you know, we, we now have some conversations and evidence to show the possibility of this third way. It goes back a hundred years, these kinds of conversations, but here in America we've forgotten. It has to do with what creates the conditions for cooperative decision making, as opposed to total chaos among individuals. And it has to, and Ostrom's Finding is cheap talk, she calls it. You gotta talk. You gotta talk face to face. You gotta work things out. So let me ask, so her point as well is that it's not an economic scarcity that prevents us from having commons. There, it's not even an economic scarcity of land because here in Oakland alone, and I also have done Berkeley and other communities, there's over a thousand acres of land flat enough to at least put some small 
freestanding tiny homes and create little villages and still have space for things like community gardens or farming. I don't know. So uh, there's a group called Oakland Land Action that's working on trying to use ethical squatting. They've run into a lawsuit, so I don't know how fast they're working on their vision of 100 micro farms in the city of Oakland, but there are things that we could do and that I'm proposing we can do to move a little more quickly. And this is, I'll, maybe I can bring this up later, but it has to do with, right now, tiny homes or RVs, and for the most part, most cities have made it extremely hard, if not almost impossible, to have an RV and live in it. You can park it and use it as a studio, but you can't live in it. Fresno is now the exception, and there are some exceptions that the state allows for counties, but most cities, certainly our cities, have not yet embraced those exceptions. So the idea is to have, by right, the ability to park, well, one is to recode the whole concept, not RV, but call it sleeping quarters or portable shelter, as they've done in Eugene and Madison. Uh, and that's, that's citizens stepping up and saying, hey, could you do this? Can we do this? Can't we do this? Doesn't this make sense? Let's try it. Uh, so we add a few new, new definitions. We tweak some of our building and land use codes. Uh, and, and then we can create, my proposal is to create a process whereby a combination city and citizen review board can look at proposals that meet criteria to use public land and to lease that public land. And to allow renewal of the leases based on actual performance rather than what we have now, which is a kind of either neighbor veto, neighbors get to veto projects in many places, or the banks veto it. So by creating a very low cost way to get small private dwellings onto land with shared facilities based on basic principles of co-housing, intentional community, cooperative housing, and, and commons all around the world, we could actually begin to fill in a critical niche in the housing market uh, that uh, young, younger people, people who want to live simply, uh, homeless people in transition, tiny homes aren't for everyone, as we will hear, but for those who want it, we want, it, we want, it, we want them to have a choice. So thank you very much. I'll appreciate talking with you later. And once again, join the crowd of cooperative living. Take care. Right. Thanks. Yeah. I don't think we had any introductions or bios. Did you want to do that now, David? You did. The panelists are supposed to introduce themselves. Oh, yeah. oh okay. 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 All right. I can. If you mind. I, I'll say a few words later. <laughs> but while you hook up, I'll say that. Uh, since my 20s, I've lived in collective housing situations, housing cooperative, the last 12 years in Berkeley co-housing, which is what's called a limited or shared equity uh, uh, community, voluntarily, voluntarily reduced, kept our return on investment and tax, uh, in cooperation with the city, of course, the city requires it. Uh, but I have a master's and a doctorate in city and regional planning, specifically to pursue this question that has fascinated me, what is community and how does it actually play out? What does it mean in our day-to-day -day life? Thanks. So uh, I'm Aaron Castle, this is my fiance, Candace Anderson. We lived in our self-built tiny house on wheels. Um, we built it in San Mateo, California on the site of a salvage yard. Uh, we lived in it now o over two years and um, moved in three different locations. And uh, <clears throat> can you hear me in the back? <laughs> um, so we're just uh, here to share. Um, so we're just here to share our uh, personal story and our personal experiences. Our personal story and personal experiences in um, building and living in a tiny house. So did you want to add something to who we are? Um, nope, that's good. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess when we started this journey, um, we were living in a one-bedroom apartment or a three-bedroom apartment. We were sharing a room together um, for a thousand dollars a month, um, and we're tired of living with other living in that situation. Um, so we started looking for a studio or one bedroom apartment for us to live together. Um, and we couldn't find anything under $1,600, which right now that's like That'd a steal of a deal. <laughs> like if you find rent for $1,600, take it. Um, so um, 
Aaron was ready to build. He want, has wanted to live in a tiny house for a while, and I couldn't really wrap my head around, like, well, what am I going to do with all my stuff? Um, so once I started watching some YouTube videos and Aaron did some convincing and started realizing um, that the stuff wasn't all that important and I could find other options for it, um, we went ahead and bought a utility trailer. Yeah, so we're minimum wage kids and we're struggling oops, to make things work. And, um, and uh, we're getting getting priced out of the, the market and we're seeing more and more um, low wage jobs open up and um, more and more high wage jobs being created. Um, naturally, that's gonna bump up against the available housing and, and cause that housing bubble. So um, we saw that coming and, and it's funny when you use the term housing crisis, it means a, a lot different what it means today than it did um, in 2008 and again, um, it's kind of a loaded term, but I think uh, what we should call it is a housing affordability affordability crisis, really, um, yeah. and it, yeah. and who's affected. And we, um, when we start talking about what is a, a median wage income, we're not talking about you know thirty thousand, forty thousand. We're talking eighty and ninety thousand dollars in median wage jobs, and, and these are um, important sectors of our economy. We're talking teachers, doc nurses, and um, uh, emergency um, tech, like you don't, you want a trained emergency response team if you're going to have a medical emergency. Um, so, uh, so, oh, geez, where where were? So we were we were looking at. Um, we just decided to do it. I was working um, a demolition job, and uh, the, the boss. It was a whole house building supply. It's an architectural salvage and demolition company. We would do demolition sales and um, bring people out to the site of houses being demolished, and you know, sell the doors and the windows and the hardware and um, and. Uh, so uh, the, my boss there gave, um, gave us a spot and, and really um, helped us in this process. And um, my, my mother, you know, uh, it's a uh, find that you lean on the community, uh, let us stay in her spare bedroom um, while we were built. So that kind of enabled us to take this money that was being vaporized in rent every month and, um, and apply it towards something real, like a real asset that we would own when it was done building. And it turns out <laughs> it'll probably never be done building because as a home and as any sort of love relationship, it's something that kind of takes a lot of maintenance and it's something that you're always doing. So, um, so next, next slide. slide. <laughs> um, so. All right, so our main, um, reason for doing this was economic necessity. Um, Aaron grew up here, um, had family, friends in the area. Um, I moved here about eight and a half years ago, um, and there was no way that we'd be able to stay in the Bay Area together um, if we didn't do this. So that was the economic necessity was key. Um, we also wanted to work towards a self-employment model and self-sufficiency, um, which was really important to both of us. Um, and now, four years later, starting to see that happen, um, which is really great, yay. <laughs> um, and the other thing we wanted to do was to keep our um, rent payments local and to support people that we cared about. Um, so um, it was really disheartening to hear what Betsy was sharing too, with, and we'd seen that on Craigslist ads too in the last year or so and how rents have gone up so much that it's becoming unaffordable again. But what we wanted to do was to help people that could use a little bit of extra income um, in their monthly monthly income and then in exchange for helping them out in the yard or with housework, um, some sort of exchange to help with rent as well. Um, and then environmental and sustainability concerns. Um, obviously we're in a situation where Lots of, sorry. Go ahead. Suburban <laughs> sprawl isn't going to continue to work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this seemed like a really good option for us to um, eventually get off the grid as well. So um, this is our tiny house. It was parked in a driveway in Redwood City. Um, we, the neighbor, we found that this is a complaint-based system. Um, and the neighbor was not very happy that there's a tiny house next door to her. Um, and she didn't really necessarily get along with the person we were living with, so it caused more tensions. Um, she 
called attention to the city and we got into it with them, went back and forth with the code enforcement. Um, long story short, it was determined that it was legal for us to park it there indefinitely, but we couldn't live in it. We couldn't sleep in it. We couldn't cook in it. We couldn't bathe in it or anything like that. Um, so, um, go ahead. So we moved um, four blocks away and before we moved in with the where we ended up being for two years, um, we went and talked to the neighbors and said what our intentions were. And in that particular neighborhood, um, the, the the sort of the the rents were just really starting to rise, and we were starting to see a lot of the, our immediate next door neighbors were you know renting out illegal rental units in the garage, and um, and now it's kind of rampant in that um, neighborhood. So it's. And then the other neighbors loved us. They're like, oh, you have a tiny house? Great, welcome to the neighborhood. Which we were stoked to hear after the last neighbor situation. So, um. And there was that opportunity for mutuality. Um, she definitely um, benefited by having a little extra income and our presence um, uh, was able to do yard work. And, um, and we saved a lot of money on rent. And, and over that time, um, that was kind of where our investment matured. And um, the $15,000 we put into building the tiny house, you know, we made that back over the course of two years of paying $400 a month of rent, if you think about it. Um, so, and now um, we've found ourselves in um, an interesting situation at the Catholic Worker House in San Bruno, and they have a radical philosophy um, uh, that nobody should pay for services and nobody should be paid for the services they give and by sort of eliminating monetary things out of that exchange, it uh, facilitates that mutuality and now um, I think what you see it, in the generalized critique against tiny houses and against like homeless, um, helping the homeless and against sort of um, affordable housing and is the, the cultural um, myth that, that it's pervasive that, um, that we're in, in inherently greedy people and that we're inherently lazy and that um, what we want with our lives and what will make us happy is you know material wealth and the ability to have more free time and the um, and not work so um, but I found that without rent and without uh, <laughs> having to pay for food really um, my time is, is, is started to be around living, um, learning, and um, serve, serving others. And um, I spend a lot of my time working, but um, a different kind of job. So I guess what I'm starting a new career in social work, <laughs> and uh, um, and it, it, it kind of calls in. And that's one of the things that you'll see against the talking points against um, basic income and. And, uh, and and I think it's it's a fear a fear based thing. I think it's uh, when um, I, I recently had an experience where there was a a news story on our tiny house, and and there are many like kind of trollish comments that um, that would say, oh, you want to live a, a low productivity lifestyle, or you're useless, like or attacks suck, or. Um, you're intentionally, you know, putting yourself in in this place of not making money or being a productive member of society, um, where I would argue that um, that that is probably that I've become kind of more productive and more more of a <laughs> more of a productive member of society than I ever was making sandwiches or um, tearing down mansions to remodel them before anybody ever lived in them. So. So we got some photos of our tiny house. Um, there, oh, these are, um, so just to kind of show you what it looks like. Um, so we've got like a living area, office space, um, kitchen, kind of on the, same, on the main area, um, two doors, um, a ladder to go up to the sleeping loft, uh, stove, um, fridge, we use a toaster oven mostly to cook and then a little hot plate. Um, and closets, both of our closets. So this is what it looks like when it's clean. Um, and it's really great to live in a tiny house when it's clean. You wake up and it's like, ah, oh, this is great space. Um, everything's organized, everything has its spot. 
um, their sleeping loft. Um, but the majority of the time, or m most, a lot of the times, um, it's a little more hectic and a little crazy because things don't always go back to the spot where they should be. Um, so it gets a little crazy here, the messy tiny house photos. Um, our closets tend to like fall out into the entryway. It's a good thing we have two doors because we can't use that door all the time. Um, and dishes tend to stack up. We can make a meal um, one night and look like we threw a party and have to clean it up all up again to make another meal. Um, so that gets really overwhelming sometimes. Um, and sometimes like, okay, I just need to get out of here for a little bit um, and come back and regroup. Um, but the realization that like, if I put 10 minutes into picking this up, it's gonna be a vast improvement. Um, and it definitely outweighs hours and hours of cleaning a large house. So, um, and our biggest, I think our biggest challenge is clothes and laundry. And, um, so we've downsized a lot, but, and we've downsized our clothes a lot too, but um, that, that still seems to be a sticking point for us. So. <laughs> so yeah, the key is just to have a place for everything. Um, and in theory, this works really well, but as you saw, it doesn't always fall, work that way. Um, so we use baskets for clothes, food, towels, sheets, um, wine boxes. And um, we have a lane cedar chest for our couch, and that's got tons of storage inside of there. Um, and then one of the big stickers for, for me was where am I going to put all my art supplies? Um, and for a while we rented art space, which I was able to afford when we were paying less rent. Um, um, but then when we were, had to move out of that, Aaron built yard, yard sheds, yard closets, and art studios, um, which we had in the, um, we have one of them with us now, but we had three in the last place. Um, and that was really helpful too, just to have a separate spot for creative space. And You want to talk about that? And it helped facilitate the move. Yes, um, I did. wanted to bring this, this here today, this item, um, but somebody's actually living in it right now. <laughs> I have um, a couple guys in Redwood City. Um, we ended up, uh, somebody uh, checked out our blog and then uh, um, offered to donate an RV. So we ended up with a, an RV and um, there's a guy living in that. And um, I put this, it also fits in the back of a trailer. It can be lifted by three guys when it's empty. Um, and I would, I, would, uh, yeah, I would hate to call um, tiny houses for homeless people tiny houses and um, as sort of a permanent um, living option. Like you have to be in, into minimalism. You have to be into, it's a commitment. It's, a, it's an intentional commitment. And we made that commitment to each other when we started building the house. And it's, it's been a difficult commitment to um, kind of keep as I guess any, um, relationship would be. Um, so uh, we have somebody living in the RV. This is on a trailer behind the RV and some another gentleman is living in there. Um, it's not, uh, these are both working guys. Um, they're making, one of them's working over at a, uh, a grocery store and the other one's sort of like a handyman. And um, both really important. Um, to people in the community and as you know sort of more the housing becomes more more of a problem hiring people and keeping talent is going to be um, more and more of a problem until of course you know we can get robots to do our jobs for us um, but um, so uh, I want, wanted to say something about right to dream too and um, Betsy mentioned them as organizing the um, the Portland um, the opportunity Opportunity, Dignity, Opportunity Village in Portland. And um, they're, they started out with them. Eugene. Eugene. Opportunity is in Eugene, but I think there were Right to Dream ordinances. Was well, Portland, yeah. yeah. I get the Opportunity and Dignity Oregon. Village yeah. all mixed up. Um, <laughs> but it, Which I shouldn't because I've been to both of them. Um, <laughs> which maybe that's why I get them mixed up. But um, they, they, the Right to Dream 2, it started with the Right to Dream 2 process and their, um, their mission statement, their purpose was we exist to awaken individuals and organizations to the importance of safe and undisturbed sleep. So when we start talking about the homeless, we're not talking about a, a certain group of people, we're talking like about a very complex population of, of different kinds of people and I think that the, the more we steer away from looking at homelessness or um, as like 
a type of person and more as homelessness as an experience. Um, and as we move into the future, we're, we're definitely going to see more and more people experiencing homelessness. That's the one thing that we know. Yeah. And um, and and when you you know project decades out in the world economy, you're looking at. Um, 40% or more of the world's population um, squatting in um, 20 years. So, um, so homelessness should be thought of as an experience and therefore sort of the um, response to that should be thought of as, as policy and uh, many people argue um, when and will accuse the Reagan administration of creating homelessness, but I think um, it happens kind of in all of our hearts once like we we shed our hearts out to um, being open to the experiences of others that 's where um, that 's where homelessness starts in our society and um, um, and we found that it, 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 the more we share our story, the more kind of people open their hearts to us and um, the stronger our network gets. So what are we doing now? Well, we invite people that um, are interested in tiny houses or living in tiny houses to, um, to come see our tiny house. Um, it gives us a great excuse to clean. <coughs> and, um, and, and it's always refreshing after giving. Um, it's, it's always like this affirming experience, I find. Um, uh, we've had very few naysayers through, and even the naysayers um, have been kind of like a, a like a, a spiritually building experience um, for me. Uh, <laughs> Did you want to talk about? Uh, well, <clears throat> so you, if if you were to search tiny houses and homeless on the internet, you would find um, no no fewer than seven major sites where things are happening: Nashville, um, Austin, Texas. Um, Portland, and um, every, week. every week, yeah, a new <laughs> spot opens up, yeah, and it's it's really kind of growing and growing, and and we're assured that there's going to be more and more people interested in this because more and pe more and more people are going to feel the financial strain, and um, and it's not only um, it's sort of a cross section of design nerds and um, <laughs> and and <laughs> you even uh, see. You know, people with a lot of access to wealth and privilege who are living this way. Um. <clears throat> All right, so here's some sites if you want to check out um, the Tent City Urbanism book was what Betsy um, had mentioned. That's oh, a so yeah, pick up one from her, um, pick up a book from her, check them out online. Um, the Opportunity Village and the Emerald Village um, can be found at the squareonevillages.org. Um, and then Reverend Jeff Carr and Elvis Summers are both good people to look up and to see what they're doing. Um, one of the other um, things that we'd want to work towards is working with local governments to shift the regulations, as Betsy was saying. And it seems like there's small tweaks that can be made to make this a really simple solution to house folks um, and keep them in their communities, keep them local to their support networks. Um, just to cut down on commutes, we're finding people are commuting two hours a day to get into their jobs and then back. Um, so just keeping people local, um, cutting down commute and traffic, all that is going to benefit the entire working force um, and give people a more stable living situation than they may currently be in. Um, and a there you go. Um, <coughs> a couple things that are happening out here in the East Bay. Um, there's an East Bay Tiny House Meetup group, and um, I guess that's sponsored by Laney College, who has a, um, oh, we're out of time. But um, yeah, please visit our blog. We have cards and links, and you can read more about what's going on, or come see our tiny house in person. It's in San Bruno, right off the transit. And you'll be giving a talk in Fremont tomorrow? Yes, yes, we'll be in Fremont oh. tomorrow. Yeah. At noon? At, at, uh, uh, oh. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but the, just take a look at this. If um, you're interested, there's lots of people getting together to learn more about tiny houses and how they can work locally together to um, see some of these things move forward. So. Yeah. People in the audience who are part of those. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Wonderful. Uh, so for Q&A, I would like, if people would like to hear the conversation, come step on out to the Sidewalk Cafe, the own sort of mini tiny house outdoors. Uh, I can do it. Uh,